Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Good morning. Uh, after a little bit of technical differences, I think we have this uh, pretty much working. So uh, my name is Marcel Holtmann and I'm going to give you an introduction into what we have released a couple of months ago, which is a brand new Bluetooth standard. Um, so before I go any further, as usual, since I work for Intel, blah, 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 disclaimers. So Linux is Linux Torts trademarks, Zephyr is a Linux Foundation trademark, and Bluetooth is a Bluetooth SIG trademark. Everything else are trademarks as well, if I forgot to actually mark them correctly. Um, quick one about myself. So I've been doing the Linux Bluetooth stack since 2004, which is already an awful long time. Um, in the meantime, I created Conman, a connection manager, Ophone, a cellular stack, uh, Packrunner for handling proxy setups, L, an embedded Linux library, and also IWD, which you can actually hear about tomorrow, if you care about what we have done in the last year on that one. Um, I joined Intel in 2007, so it's pretty much 10 years right at Intel so far. Um, I chair the Internet Working Group, so we're trying to actually get more IP networks over Bluetooth and integrate it more properly. Um, I'm sitting on the Architectural Review Board as well, so spending a lot of boring time on reviewing specs and standards. Um, and I've contributed massively to the mesh standard that I'm going to introduce you today. So uh, it has been something around three years right to actually get even the standard out the door, including getting some uh, implementations of it around as well. So why actually redoing everything and all over again. So pretty much this weird hype term of Internet of Things drives a lot of innovation. Um, fundamentally breaks down is that we want to actually connect everything and you're not going to connect anything with cables. So we need to start picking the wireless standard we want to use. And there's so multitudes of wireless standards around for any kind of embedded device or Internet of Things standards. Um, the really only problem is that which ones you're going to pick. And if you pick one, you can't do the other one. If you pick this one, it's maybe not in the phone. Your phone is uh, with you on a daily basis and so on and so forth. So when we set out around three years ago to actually do Bluetooth mesh, it's like, look, we want to actually get something that is in the phone. So either do Wi-Fi or you do Bluetooth uh, or you do cellular, uh, 5G, for example. Um, but the lowest power one is Bluetooth. So we actually focus on let's get Bluetooth going instead of trying to make 15.4 better and get it integrated into the phones or use LoRa or any kind of light based uh, uh, standard, etc. And obviously the choice is pretty obvious since everything is better with Bluetooth anyway. So uh, we picked on uh, trying to do the next generation of Bluetooth. Um, before we actually introduced Bluetooth Mesh, Bluetooth was rather boring technology. It was point to point and had, it's around since uh, before 2000, so it's a really old standard. So we are, I think we're approaching next year 20 years of Bluetooth. Um, but if you see the left hand side, you see Bluetooth Classic, which is pretty much used for in car communication, headsets, and so on and so forth. And then about uh, seven years ago, they actually set out and say, look, we're actually going to have to do something for low power devices. We have to reduce the power, power footprint on this one and the memory footprint to actually make them run on coin cell battery for a year or even longer. And this is what called Bluetooth Low Energy or Bluetooth Smart. And so back in the days, the SIG came up with some weird terminology. Like, okay, we have Bluetooth Classic, we have Bluetooth Smart, when we are Smart Ready. And Smart Ready just means you have the dual mode devices combined that can talk to both sides. Classic devices can't talk to low energy devices. You always need one in the middle that can actually do both. So until about uh, beginning of this year, that was the standard how we had it, point to point dual mode devices. Your phone was a dual mode device. Your headset was a single mode for classic and your heart rate monitor was a single mode for uh, low energy. Um, that got completely turned around and made a lot more complicated uh, beginning of the year. So they keep classic around. It stays point to point. But for low energy, we actually introduced multiple extra things. So you can still do point-to-point, -point, read your sensor data from your heart rate monitor, etc. But you can also do massive broadcasting because we have all this beacon market where you have location positioning and so on and so forth. So you can basically broadcast your location or any information like URLs, Eddy Stone, iBeacon, etc. Um, and then on top of that one, now you had mesh. You actually can span mesh topologies and actually do something for this for lighting or something else. Um, it gets a lot more complicated, and I go through this in a little bit of detail, but fundamentally on the left side, Classic is what it is. There's no innovation happening on Classic. All the innovation happens in low energy. You will still use Classic if you use a Bluetooth headset for a really long time. My prediction is at least the next 8 to 10 years, uh, but every new development will happen on uh, Bluetooth LE. Um, the thing is, when you actually have a point-to-point -point technology, and one extent this with Mesh, you can't do this just by saying I'm going to build a mesh topology and then I'm done with it. Um, you need a lot more. 
So even if your network layer is mesh capable, that doesn't mean you can't do anything without. You need actually layers on top that actually know how to do certain things. Um, when we set out to do Bluetooth mesh, the fundamental problem was if we actually have to broadcast data, the maximum PDU size is 31 octets. You have to subtract two octets for actually get the basic information uh, prepended on this one. So you're left with 29 octets to do a secure mesh capable network. So that's quite a challenge. And that's what actually led to this whole stack that we actually had to do on these lower multiple levels. So the bearer is pretty much where you have the minimum of 29 octets. The, the alternate bearers, if you're actually in a connection or if you're connectionless, uh, then you have your network layer that will define your basic PDU formats. And I have a diagram with this one later, so don't worry, I'll show you this one as well. Um, but it does addressing how you address one node in a network, uh, how you do encryption, decryption, um, and especially how you make, uh, make sure that everything is authenticated and secure. So mesh, or well, Bluetooth mesh in specific, there's no unsecure network. The network is always encrypted and authenticated. We can't actually do any unsecure networks. Um, and we separate in network encryption from application encryption because that's two independent things. You have, because you're operating 29 octets, we had to do a segmentation and reassembly layer. Um, and then we had to have a level that actually uh, encrypts the author application messages and authenticates them. Uh, we need to define how you do the data formats, because if you only have 29 octets and you want to tell a LAMP to go on, you don't want to span this over three messages, because then they keep waiting for these messages to arrive. So you want to keep them as short as possible, so you also need to play a little bit of trickery with, uh, with the message formats. Then you need to configure this whole network, because if you don't know how to build your network, configure it and use it, it's pretty much useless. Then you just have a network and can't do anything with this one. And then you want to have actually do uh, uh, lightning models on this one, or power models, or something else. So actually you can switch on something off, you can switch something off, or you can get sensor data like uh, your HVAC is at uh, this term, at this operational mode, etc. Um, what is really important, mesh is not a new radio. We didn't build a new radio, we didn't build a new Mac layer, we just built a network topology. So you actually have Bluetooth Low Energy as the basic radio around it, and then the topology on how you actually turn that one into a mesh network is what we have defined. And if we recap this, uh, we get to the level that we actually have the old classic pairing side of things where you have one device and otherwise, so pretty much point to point. Mesh can use this as well for, for backwards uh, compatibility. So if you have a device that doesn't know how to do broadcasting or doesn't know how to do mesh, you can use a point-to-point -point connection as a single entry hop into the network and say, look, I will, I will bridge you into this network if you can't do anything else, which is great. So you can take your current phone that you have, install an application, and you can get access to a mesh network. Um, but fundamentally, if you want to build the mesh, you need to broadcast the packets because we can't do any point-to-point -point connections anymore, and actually building star topology or mesh topology based on point-to-point -point connections is really complicated because you spend a lot of time actually managing this one, and you actually need a lot of memory. So assume we want to run this on coin cell batteries, and we need to manage 100 and, uh, or 1,000 nodes. You don't have the memory capacity in your controller to actually do these. So we're broadcasting every packet out which means we actually use the advertising feature of Bluetooth Low Energy to just send a packet, and whoever's in vicinity will receive that packet. And based on that one, then you finally enter the level where you actually get a mesh topology, where you say, look, all these devices have the same keys and the same network, and they can successfully talk to each other, and we can actually have addresses assigned to any of these nodes. Um, I will get back to this one, how the topology is built in a, in a, in a slide or two, um, but this is just the basic idea. Um, I grabbed a stack diagram from Nordic to just show you how they actually, this is fundamentally different than whatever else you've done before. So on the middle side, you see the good old Bluetooth low energy stack. You have a link layer, you have L2CAP, you have a security manager, you have add, you have GAT, you have GAP, and that's pretty much how everything runs today. Um, Nordic always has some extra specifics around, but this is good for demonstration purposes on how they actually had to integrate this, because you fundamentally have to do the same if you want to build this. So on the left side, you have a Bluetooth mesh stack that pretty much circumvents everything because it only actually needs to talk uh, to your radio and actually put uh, your packets on the air and receive the packets from the air because it builds the packets um, in a specific format. Well, the format is still the low-level format of Bluetooth LE, but it doesn't really say that you have to go to the link layer. You just have to format them uh, correctly. And there's a lot of extra timing involved with this one, so you don't repeat packets too often. Because the more you put the packet on the air, the more power you consume, the more you, power you consume on your receiver side. 
But the interesting one that they forgot to mention on this one is that we also have the legacy entry point. We have a point-to-point -point connection. So the Bluetooth mesh stack on the left side, fundamentally you also have to put this on the middle side where you actually have a, a gut or connection-oriented channel um, and stack this on top of this one for legacy purposes. So it gets shrink wrapped multiple ways. Um, but it's good for demonstration purposes that you pretty much have two things uh, side by side. Um, before I show you the topology slide, we actually ended up with um, four different features. Uh, I, you can call them roles, but they can also happen. You can have multiple features on the same node, so the roles don't really match because it's more like an OR feature than an uh, uh, XOR. Um, so you have a low power feature. If you actually build a mesh topology and want to run on a coin cell battery, you need to consider the devices that really only have a coin cell battery um, and then say, look, I want to be only on air when I need to be. Because every time you have to be uh, turn your receiver on, you consume so much power that you actually can't uh, stay on your battery for long. So you have these devices that really have a tiny battery and they pretty much say, I'm on now, someone needs to help me to get my data. So that's what's called LPNs or low power nodes and they always have to talk to someone else. They're pretty much edge nodes and then uh, go and say, look, I'm setting up a friend of mine and I'm waiting for them to forward me the messages in case I'm offline and miss them. And the friend is just the opposite role where they actually have to tell, uh, are always on power and they're happy to uh, give other uh, low power nodes the packets. And a friend can talk to multiple low power nodes, but a low power node generally only have a single friend. And then we have a mesh network, so messages need to be relayed because we want to span the uh, extra width of the network. So if you want to cover a whole building, a 10 meter range of a Bluetooth radio is not going to cut it, so you need to have multiple of them and they have to relay the messages one to another one and, and go through this. Um, the proxy one is what I mentioned earlier for backwards compatibility. If you want to have a phone bridged into your network that is not mesh capable, it needs to do this over uh, uh, GAT connections for Bluetooth, and this is pretty much what the proxy does. Okay, I'm along you in, you can actually send the message, and then I'll relay everything back to you. If you draw this up, you get a pretty much easy topology feature of this one, um, where you have like fans, uh, ceiling fans, light bulbs, and switches, etc. What is generally considered is that the light bulbs and ceiling fans are always powered, so they can easily relay messages, they can easily be friends, and so on and so forth. Then you have uh, proxies, like a phone, that will talk to, uh, sorry, you have proxy uh, capable uh, light bulbs, and they can then, uh, the phone can talk to them and then say, oh, I'm on a part of your network. But you already see that the proxy is a little bit of an outside because it doesn't do anything else. It talks to one specific friend and the friend then has to bridge everything. So you can't have a different path into the network. Once you choose your proxy, you're going through that proxy and don't say, I'm just sending the message to everybody and hopefully someone is in the vicinity to pick it up. So you have to find a dedicated proxy. Uh, friendship is pretty much the similar concept. You find a single friend and then you go through that one through the network. Um, but all the other nodes, the route from the switch on the right to the light bulb on the left, there's no specific route it goes. It can go to the top, go through another switch, it can go to a ceiling fan, and so on and so forth. So we really rely on that the messages are relayed through the whole network and everybody can see them. Um, and coming to this point, the relaying in Bluetooth Mesh is actually kept on purpose simple. Because the more complex you make it, and you have routing in there, you actually need memory, and that memory you don't have, and if you need a lot of memory, you need to uh, consume also more power, so it gets really tricky. So pretty much if you decided, I'm have enough power, I will relay messages, then you actually do and retransmit these messages as needed. You can do maximum of 127 hops, and generally that's a pretty large area if you consider you have a range between uh, 10 and 100 meters on a Bluetooth radio. Um, we do flooding, so it's a flooding-based mesh network, so every message you get gets back to everybody else, so you're basically flooding everything out. Um, it is considered what's called a managed flood. Um, in general, you retransmit the message to other devices, but you actually put a TTL on this one, so you don't have circular flooding, so it doesn't get back to you, and will stop eventually. And you can manage that TTL uh, on your network. When you really realize that your network is really small, you decrease the TTL and then it get, doesn't get flooded too far. And there's an in, in, implicit message cache that is mandatory that will avoid you actually taking messages up and stupidly repeating them. So once you've seen it before, you're actually not going to repeat it again. Um, and I have, uh, have a little bit of... Uh, a PDU diagram later on, there you'll see how this is actually uh, uh, possible to do these kind of things. Security, sorry, security has to be in there, so we actually put the uh, security at all layers, so as a network layer security, um, that is, every packet is encrypted and authenticated. With a MIG, AES, CCM, 120 and bit, 
um, fully encrypted, that key is shared for all devices in the whole network. So you have one shared key for your network. If you lose that key, then attackers can get in your network and see parts of the network. Um, but since the application and the models are actually protected with different keys, the only thing they can see uh, packets in the network. If you have the network key, you can pretend to be a relay. So if you're uh, some sort of an attacker, you, the only thing you gain with the network key is that you can play in relay, and your homeowner might actually thank you. Thanks for actually helping me out. Um, sequence numbers are at all levels as well, so we actually avoid replay text. You can't really replay a packet because the sequence number has to be always increased. If you run out of sequence numbers, there's a procedure to rotate the keys, and then you rotate the keys. Um, there's a manual in the middle detection on actually setting up the network as well, so you can't really get easily in there and say, I'm just pretending to be inside. Um, keys are rotated when needed, so if you have to take a device out, um, I don't know how much filling with trash can attacks, but pretty much your light bulb breaks, you throw it in a trash can, it still has the key in there, so people actually capable of extracting keys out of broken uh, hardware can actually take the key back and attack your network. That's called, called a trash can attack. Um, once you actually take a device out, we rotate the key, so even if they get the key out of the broken device, they can't use it anymore because the network started using a new one. And on general basis, if there's something going on, the keys actually are refreshed. It, it's a procedure that is a little more complicated in a large network, but it's the only way to protect against these things, and it uh, can happen really easily. Um, the access layer is the more interesting part, uh, because we actually, as I said, we separated the network uh, keys, but we also have application key and device keys. So if you have a lighting application, so you have 10 lights and one switch, they all share the same application key because they need to talk to each other. But they're also device keys, they are uh, pairwise keys, so the provisional device that sets up your network can have a dedicated key with your device so they can reprogram it to do something else. So meaning, even if you get an application key, it doesn't mean you can actually compromise the uh, specific uh, device. The only thing you can actually do is, oh, my set of light bulbs, I can attack and switch them on and off as I please. But it doesn't mean that you can actually use your switch on your sprinkler outside or open the door because you only got the key for the uh, lights. Um, and you see where I'm going with this one. Um, the provisioning to actually bring, as I said, the network is always encrypted, to bring the device into the network is protected with uh, uh, asymmetric uh, cryptography, so it's ECDH P256, which is standard in Bluetooth since 4.2 for secure connections, so we use the same uh, basic uh, cryptology to actually get the device onboarded, and as we know as today, if you trust the NIST, then P256 curves are pretty safe and we don't have quantum computers. This is as good as it gets. Um, it's only used for initial step, but it will generate a unique device key that is derived, so it's not even some random number that you can get wrong. It's really something that you have to get right, and it's a 100-bit uh, strong key for AS. And then you get network keys uh, distributed and application keys distributed as needed. Um, obviously, you will only install application keys into the device that you know them. So if your light should only know about the application key for your lighting, and your door should only know about the application key of your uh, door, if you install application key in every device, then you actually... Uh, uh, avoiding this or um, uh, breaking the separation that you actually would need. So if we actually break this down, how these packets look like, how they go over the years. So I said we have 29 octets, that's pretty tiny, um, but we have a network identification at the, at the top, it's an one octet, one octet or actually to be priced 7 bit plus an uh, 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 IV index uh, bit um, that will give you basic identification on is this packet for my network or not. So you have a 7-bit probability to actually figure out, do I need to decrypt this packet or not? It's good if you have your neighbor has three networks set up, you have three networks set up, so you actually have some sort of chance that you don't try to decrypt a packet that is not for you. Because the only way to decide if the decryption was successful is if your network MIC actually succeeds. Um, we have an obfuscated bit and an encrypted bit. So generally, with the most part of the message, we want it to be encrypted. Um, we can't encrypt everything, because if I don't know what the source is, and the sequence number and the TTL, I have no idea what I'm decrypting against. Because the TTL, sequence number, and source is actually used as nouns, so you don't, uh, you have proper sequence counter for your encryption. Um, so they need to be in plain text, they need to part uh, of your packet. Um, but we actually didn't want to put the source address into the packet, because then everybody can learn the source address is all in the network really easy. So they are obfuscated with a single AES uh, and a dedicated privacy key that really only you can know when you know the network key. So they're not encrypted, but they're so hard to uh, uh, guess that it becomes almost unlikely. But it's in theory possible, hence only if obfuscated and not encrypted. And then your destination address uh, is encrypted and actually your whole PDUs are completely encrypted and then you have a MIC uh, at the end of it that protects it. 
And then the destination, as I said, is encrypted, the PDU is encrypted, and then you will decrypt it, and then you have your transport PDUs, and then you're going to roll up. As I said, in your lower transport layer, you actually have segmentation and reassembly, so then we do segmentation and reassembly. But at that point, the payload has its separate encryption on top of this one. So this is how it, the packet fundamentally goes over the air. So even if you see a mesh network, you can't really know, is this the same mesh network, what are the addresses in it, etc. So it takes a lot of time to actually uh, uh, crack any of this one. While the lower level PDUs are really easy to get, you don't even need any special hardware. You can get an off-the-shelf Bluetooth dongle and start scanning for the network and you will see that there's some mesh network ongoing. No dedicated sniffers needed. Um, provisioning is a little bit more complicated since the network is fully encrypted, so we actually need to play a lot of uh, extra steps to get a network onboarded. Um, the basic idea is if a device is brand new, out of the box, it beacons with an identification, I'm unprovisioned, please go and provision me. And then you either use uh, an authenticate procedure, it's somebody you have a code on the box or a barcode that you can scan, and then you have uh, out-of-band protection, actually get the whole device uh, securely onboarded. But the device, you will send an invitation, you will exchange keys with public key cryptography, you get your authentication, and then you distribute all the information for that device inside the network. This includes basic models, basic configuration, its address, and so on and so forth, and additionally application keys, uh, and so on. Um, pretty straightforward procedure, really complicated, totally not enough time to actually talk to this one. If you're in cryptography, that's really interesting because it's quite complicated. But on a basic level, it follows the same that we have done with Bluetooth uh, 4.2, where we actually introduce secure connections and make sure that we actually use ECDH and P256 correctly um, and get this all working. For actually using the network, we actually also had to go different ways. Because the main focus is uh, like home automation, lighting, doors, etc., we had to actually figure out a way how you address the devices. Because you don't really want to address a single device, you want to address a group. If you click a switch and your room has five, six light bulbs, you want to have them all go on at the same time, but you don't want to repeat your message six times because that's just cost bandwidth and it's complicated. So it's really a model publish and subscribe. Basic model says you actually have address assignments that allows you to actually address a single device and you give it the address and then uh, um, the six lights actually take this as, oh, this is all for me, and then they uh, change their state and switch on. So pretty straightforward, but to actually make this work, the whole design gets a lot more complicated when it comes to uh, how we actually have the inner working. So getting the nesh, mesh network working while cramming the, everything in 29 octets is complicated, but then also actually making the logic work is uh, even more complicated. So a note is pretty much a single device, whatever it does. But a node can have multiple elements, and this goes similar to what uh, services have been in Bluetooth Classic. You have a primary element, and you have additional elements. So in a simple case, you have a light bulb that has a single element that is automatically the primary element, and then you have the functionality in it. So what you can do with a light bulb, on, off, and you can maybe adjust the brightness if it's a little more pricier one. And then you have the conditions of these elements. Okay, you can do on or off, obviously, and the brightness level is from 0 to 10. And this is described with your models. Um, and this is where it gets pretty much right into the next one. Oh, um, model and states, Ooh, okay. Um, so everything is pretty much in models, and the model defines the format as well. Um, and then you have the state and like what state it is currently and what's happening. So the states are, are I'm on or off, and what's my brightness? It's between 0 and 10. Um, not of much of this one is defined that you can dynamically discover it because you don't actually have the capacity in the network to say, oh, what do you support? Uh, or you support uh, 0 to 10, the other one supports 0 to 11, then you actually try to make sense out of this. And so everything is a lot of statically defined to actually do switching something on really quickly. And you need to do this with lighting, otherwise you have this popcorn effect where one light, uh, if you have 20 light bulbs in your room, and you press the switch and the first 10 go really quickly and the other 10 go a, a 250 millisecond delayed and the other one 200 millisecond delayed, like, what's going on there? They need to relatively go on at the same time, so you need to cram everything in a small PDU. So you want a single message, and everybody receives that at the same time, so they can react at the same time. So you need to keep things small, and the only way to do this is if you statically define this. So if you want to build a different light bulb that has uh, different brightness states or whatever, and can do other fancy things, you pretty much have to inherit the model and build a different model on top of this one, so they can talk to each other. And there are vendor models as well, if you want to do something that is not spec'd in the standard. Um, more interestingly, the models also have a client-server model, but also a control model. 
So the server model is obviously what you expose and the definition on how it's exposed. The client model is how you're going to use it, pretty much what message you're going to send and what implication that message has. So it means that octet you're going to send means I'm turning the light on and maybe also doing additionally something else. Um, that is possible. Uh, more interesting is the definition of a control model where you actually have some behavior that is more complicated. As an example, um, you're requesting the temperature, the temperature changes, that means it goes too high, then you actually have to turn your machinery off because it's dangerous. Or you can build scenes like this one. Uh, you say, uh, I'm watching TV now, that means my... Uh, my blinds go down, my lights are dimming, my TV goes on, and the VCR goes on or something like that. So you can build something really complicated like that. Um, obviously, this gets even more complicated when you actually start building, look, we have these models, and uh, this is an overview, how you have multiple servers, and it happens on different devices, and a client talking to control model, uh, and the control model then talking to the server models. This can be all designed, and you need to be designed to be really efficient and really quickly over the air. Otherwise, um, you're not going to make this fly in something that is uh, uh, low bandwidth and has to reach a lot of devices, even through relays in an appropriate time. I mentioned addressing a couple of times before. So it has multiple types of addresses that get really complicated. So you have an unassigned address, that is when the device is unconfigured. You have a unicast address, but the unicast address is not assigned to a node. So a device, it's assigned to actually an element. So every element in your uh, node can actually have a different address, so you can address the element uh, specifically. Uh, virtual addresses, you have then uh, a set of uh, elements that then get a label, and then you have group addresses where you can uh, define groups for publish and subscribe, or you have these magically defined groups where you can, oh, I want to target all proxies, so if you want to send the TTL differently in all proxies, you can send a single message and target more proxies to all friends or relays or even send something to the whole network. Say, look, I'm changing uh, the TTL, TTL value from 7 to 8. You can send this to everybody, and everybody just picks it up. So you can do these things, given that you have the right application key to do these things, of course. Um, addresses are generally 16-bit. The virtual addresses are UID labels that are uh, hashed, and they will give a 128-bit label. Um, obviously, there's some uh, uncertainty there, but uh, the general... Uh, considering is that you actually have conflicts really uh, seldomly, and even if you have conflicts, they don't really matter. Um, there are a few limitations, so these limitations get really, really funky. So the number of elements in a network is uh, 32K, the number of group addresses is 16K, pretty much easy, but then it gets virtual addresses, you can actually have 7 trillion of them, so you can go uh, uh, knock yourself out, and based on the fact that we have a 128-bit network key, that is the sole identification of your network. Uh, you have 340 unidentical mesh networks. I can't even print that number. I think it's not going to fit on the screen. So you can have as many networks as you want. There's really no limitations. You just create a new network key. Uh, there's an application level uh, limitation because we can't hand out as many application keys. It's a storage thing, but 4K uh, different applications, that gets you already uh, pretty far. Same as goes for the subnets, and then you can have uh, 65, 64K of scenes. Um, there's one interesting part. If you stay away for the mesh net, uh, from the mesh network, mesh, oh, mesh network for 48 weeks, you need to be reprovisioned because then you pretty much uh, have no idea what your announces are anymore and you will never get back to this one. If you come back earlier, your announce can be recovered. After that one, you kind of lost. We also have some magic bits in there that uh, the time that uh, you can be off without talking to the network and still get a valid packet without being uh, having to get to a key refresh procedure announce update is uh, uh, 24 hours plus four. So even with the sun rising and setting on uh, different times, you can be fully solar powered and get uh, uh, still stay with that network. So you get your battery powered up on your solar and then you wake up, get your messages, and you go back down. Um, so that's pretty much what you have there on the limitations. It's kind of funky limitations, but it gets you pretty far. So projects that we actually have done this on. So we focused on Zephyr OS, which is an embedded ATOS uh, backed by the Linux Foundation, and we have an open source Bluetooth uh, low energy controller source code in there, we have an open source Bluetooth stack in there, and we also have an open source Bluetooth mesh stack in there now that can be used in all possible roles. Um, it works best on Nordic uh, small devices like the BBC Microbit, so it's all available and you can uh, just play with it and toy with it. Um, 
it supports advertising and guts. So you can build a proxy to talk with your talk with your phone to it, or you can use a native advertising uh, mesh. It supports the foundation models for basic configuration and setup, and has a bunch of demos um, where you can actually have uh, devices walk around. You can provision uh, 20 of them and then send messages to each other, etc. Uh, funny enough, that stack has been also ported to Minute and other embedded uh, operating systems, so it seems uh, a lot of people make the effort in actually taking that stack, building an operating system abstraction. Zephyr doesn't have any kind of abstraction. It's built really uh, as similar as the Linux kernel. All is natively integrated, and they go through the effort in porting this over. Um, the only thing it doesn't really have at the moment is you can't provision it. So if you build a, mesh, a Zephyr mesh node, put it on a micro bit, um, you can't do much with it because it's unprovisioned. It stays um, unprovisioned. Uh, for this one, we released so far what is called mesh control, which is a gut-based uh, provisioner uh, on top of Bluezy. So you can just install its command application with a read line interface, and then you can actually provision your nodes, manage them, send commands, turn off lights, and so on. So if you find a uh, commercial uh, mesh light bulb, you can actually use that one to toy with it. Um, native mesh for Linux is coming. We are working on actually building a optimized uh, controller specification, so you would have to use Me uh, Zephyr as a Bluetooth controller, and then you can actually talk to this one. I'm expecting this to be released in about a month or two, um, so then we actually have also native mesh on Linux and can use it. Um, the reason why it's actually not that easy is because we can't, on a standard controller, we can't get the timings good enough that you will actually uh, have good operational process. So we need to build a controller first that allows you to use it. Uh, we will uh, open up the uh, extensions and uh, make them available for everybody to use. Um, if you do turn the Bluetooth logo around and may turn it into M, you have your Bluetooth mesh. Some people did this funny things. I actually found this yesterday and that was kind of interesting. Um, with this one, I'm actually done. Thanks for your attention. Do we have any questions? Please. The specification is public on Bluetooth.com. It's a public specification. You can download it. Um, but the, um, uh, so every node in the mesh is connected to each other. It's a mesh, right? So uh, and they keep um, the, they keep uh, a cache of packet seen, so they'll forward them again. You said. Cache. Yeah. So there's a packet cache based on the sequence number in there. So uh, the yeah. Is. Right. And then you you hash them, and you will not forward them if you already forwarded it or right. seen it. Um, that's true, but the assumption is that if you're really low power and concerned about your power, then you operate as low power node, and then you don't need the message caching because you will only talk to your friend, and your friend will do the message caching that has a little bit more power and a little more memory. Yeah, but your friend may be um, behind some fairly high, relatively high latency link. For example, it might be... Uh, you have to unmute the microphone to make this fly. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just going to repeat it. Go ahead. Um, so let's say you have, um, you have a friend node, which is you know, a friend relay hmm. for a bunch of other things, but it, it's behind um, a, a high latency link, like it's just, just far away, it's a kilometer away or whatever. So um, just the latency of it will, will actually... Oops. Okay. Oh. Won't the latency of it... Uh, <laughs> Oh, so yeah. So the announce is uh, specific to your node, so you don't really need to store too much to actually do an efficient uh, relay. Rough estimate is you probably need, to, depending on a TTL, you only need to care about a few. So I think the rough estimates we did on the initial implementation were around 16 or something. We keep. You make it bigger, you avoid that you actually have any attack vectors. But worse comes to worse, you relay that packet and someone else decides, oh, that's already in my cache. So yes, that's obviously not a perfect system because that costs an enormous amount of memory, same as a routing mism. So it's a, you, you pick your right value that you think for your memory use cases value. Um, the interesting part is you don't want to actually uh, send, uh, you don't want to relay everything 
uh, all together. So if someone just sends you something stupid or sends you a lot of message and overflows your message cache, you will probably relay again. So you build your device on how much, how, free, how fast you can actually can send the packet over the air and how many you actually you have to cache. So it's not a perfect system, but it actually helps a lot to uh, reduce the unwanted relays into a national network. So you can build a dumb one and you will always be relaying, which is not what we want. We want to actually say, look, you already see this, stop doing this again, or someone else relayed this. Um, the spec also has a little bit of uh, flexibility there. So if you, want, if you have enough memory and want to be smart, you can actually be a better relay node than everybody else, which is then we have to be a competitive. So if you want to innovate on top of this one and make a better implementation that is smarter, that's great. But the basic standard needs to in ensure that uh, the network actually functions. And this network, we have been tested with thousands and thousands of nodes. It actually functions really well and really fast. I, I, I don't think I, we can talk about offline on the technical details, but the, there's a lot more in there that I can actually spend in a 40 minute talk. Yes, please. It's uh, unreliable. So uh, define what you mean with unreliable. The message. I've been. Okay, try it without the microphone, and then I repeat it. <laughs> okay. So um, yes. So the message might not read. Uh, sorry, reach the. Uh, destination, what you said. So yes, that's true. Generally, if you send a message, uh, it might not reach your destination. So you have the choice between reliable and unreliable. So if you don't really care, you just want to send this and whoever hears it should act. You can do that. Or you actually have a reliability mechanism where you then have to actually send an arc. And there you, there's a support for block arcing uh, messages. So you can do this well. So you can, if you have a unicast one, you can actually send a reliable uh, message over the network, but then you need an acknowledgement mechanism that will send the acknowledgement back and you can build a reliable channel. Um, that's interesting for one-to-one -one communication through the network. It doesn't really help you much if you have 20 light bulbs in your room and you want to switch them on. Do you really care that the uh, 20th doesn't make it? Yeah, the fact that you want is you want to get your light bulb and forth. And yes, you might it bug you might crazily that the 20th one doesn't get on, um, but then you can switch it off and turn it off again. So there's something where you have we happily accept the human error or the error in the system uh, compared to when you actually need it fully reliable. If you need it fully reliable, you can do this, but you need more bandwidth in the network. So if you would do it unreliable, you need less bandwidth and you can get it done faster. So it's your choice. But it depends on the model. The model defines in how things are done. Okay, so if your 20th light bulb, so I agree, if your 20th light bulb never gets switched on because the network is built really, really poorly, I completely agree that's absolutely annoying, but maybe then you should rethink your network topology and think, realize that you have a missing uh, relay. Um, yes, it can all happen, and uh, if you think that a lot of other network topologies are better in that regard, uh, some of them are but they come at a really high cost and a high latency. So as I said, it's depending on the model if you need reliable or unreliable communication and what you're going to accept. So if you say, oh, I need super high reliable light bulbs, also build a model for this one that actually does that. But the reality is the lighting model is defined as unreliable. <laughs> okay, we're giving up on the microphone, so yes, please. So the question is, there's some sort of certification for this one? Um, yes, the Bluetooth SIG has a certification for this one. So with every Bluetooth device, you have to certify this. Um, the security, let me put it this way. There's no test for the security besides it actually works because the network is always encrypted. If you can't get it right, you will not talk to anybody ever, which means that solves it by itself. So if there's a weak device in the network that is built really stupidly. So yes, you have a device that actually has the network key, application key, or device key, and then it broadcasts it out over Ethernet to everybody to listen from or something. Yes, that's a dumb device, but uh, that's out of scope to actually certify. That's just a really bad device that should be shamed on and never be bought by anybody. 
Tell me any system where that kind of security certification is present. Um, let, me, let me answer this differently. Um, this is a network topology specification and mandating what hardware to use would be out of scope. It would be, this is not Apple, this is a standards organization that says, okay, you can, you can do whatever chip you want, once you want because it has to be vendor neutral. If you like say, I'm Apple HomeKit and I'm demanding you to use XYZ chip, that's a manufacturer choice um, and a manufacturer specification. This is an open specification, you can't do this. And I've not seen any uh, open standard doing that one. Um, the other people are waiting. Um, uh, find me offline if you have a further question. Thank you very much.